I, I just need to get one thing on tape first. I need to get your first and last name mm -hmm. and the proper spelling of it. So if you give me that, please. Yes. Uh, when you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, my name is George Harper, H-A-R-P-E-R. Mm -hmm. And what's your address? Uh, 1208 South 27th Street, Apartment C2, Tacoma. All right. So you, you started telling me not in the history books. Huh? Yes. Uh, they had a peculiar organization in World War II, and most people today have no idea. And because it doesn't show up in the history books. But we all had Army serial numbers. Now, officers had their serial numbers all begin with an O. Warrant officers would begin with a W. Now, just ordinary peons, enlisted personnel so-called, if their serial number began with a one, they were regular army. They belonged to the United States Army. If their serial numbers began with the number two, they were members of the National Guard or Reserves. And serial number three was the Army of the United States, not the United States Army. And it was AUS rather than USA. And that began with a three, and those were draftees. Now, immediately after Pearl Harbor, the government closed all enlisting, enlistment stations. And uh, everybody had to go through the draft board. So anybody that came in uh, about the first, starting someplace around the 1st of January 1942, uh, I'm not sure it was that date, but it was in that vicinity. But anybody that came in at, after that time automatically got a serial number that began with a three. My own, for instance, was 3694033, uh, for whatever that's worth. But uh, the point is that they did, so many people were trying to get into the Air Force or whatever, that nobody seemed to want to go into the infantry. And uh, in order, the task of expanding the army, the armed forces, was horrendous. Uh, before the war, we had an army of about around 250,000. By the time the war was wrapping up, we had an army of over 8 million. You didn't have the barracks facilities, we didn't have the training facilities, we didn't have the uniforms, we didn't have the weapons. So what they were doing is they established an orderly draft system where you'd go through a draft board and you would have a call number and when they got ready uh, to call up the next contingent, they would go to the draft boards. <laughs> and with an eight-week uh, cycle, uh, basic training, and then to advanced training, about every eight weeks they'd call up another batch. But uh, there were some problems that came up with that. In the case of my father, for instance, uh, he was 43 at the time. They had uh, eight or nine draft boards scattered around the country for transients. And my father and mother and I made city directories going from one community to the other around the country. So we had no fixed abode. And the registration there, you had to register in one of those uh, nine transient uh, draft boards. Well, the problem was that, in general, they would draw the youngest available ones first, the 18, 19, 20-year-olds. But when you're dealing with transients like traveling salesmen and uh, peop uh, detail men for drug, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies and things like that, you're dealing with older men. So in the draft board, my father's draft board was a draft board number nine in Detroit, Michigan. And uh, they consisted mostly of men in their late 30s and early 40s. And they're supposed to contribute also, so they were drawing the older men. 
And uh, so Dad got drafted in World War II after having served in World War I. Uh, I was at the, attending the University of Chicago when I turned 17, and I went and volunteered for the draft. You could do that after reaching age 17. If you volunteered for the draft, you were in, <laughs> uh, providing you passed the physical, of course. But at that time, I was just terrified that they would run out of war before I could get in it. Uh, believe me, back then, that was a popular war. And with my dad in the Army, uh, I figured that, yeah, I got to get in too. And besides, I'd had two years in military academy, uh, Missouri Military Academy in Mexico, Missouri. I don't even know if it's still in existence now, but uh, dad and mom and I had gotten together uh, right after the fall of France. And we said that no matter what the politicians say, you know, you can never trust a politician, any of them. Uh, they will tell you the truth only when there is no lie available. Uh, sorry about that cynicism, but it's true anyhow. Uh, so at any rate, we agreed that we were going to be in the war. That there was no way we could stay out of it. And in our family, running was never an option. It just wasn't even thought of. Uh, so the idea was I'd go to military academy and learn as much as I could that would be a, of help when I, got, when I did go in. So I did, and I did, and I did. <laughs> uh, which was rather stupid of me, but you gotta admit, remember I was 17 and 18, and at that age, I guess everybody's a, more than a little stupid. Uh, so I went in and I insisted I wanted to join the Rangers and I did. <laughs> and so now here I am uh, about uh, 57 years later uh, feeling like an old dinosaur. You know, I feel like I've been exhumed and I'm up here <laughs> trying to give a talk about things that happened back then and uh, it amazes me when kids come up and, I, and I've had them, I've had it asked of me. Uh, my own daughter was studying it in school and she had never talked too much about it when, at the time because I didn't. Uh, it's only been in the past few years that I've started to, to talk about it. Uh, because I do want some of it to be remembered. But she came in and asked, Dad, I can't get it straight. Uh, which war came first, uh, the German war against Germany or the war against Japan? It seemed as how the school devoted uh, one part of one afternoon to talking about World War II. And yet, uh, you know, that, th this was not considered politically correct, to talk about war. Uh, we were supposed to talk about peace. And uh, yet here was World War II, one of the most stupendous war, the most stupendous war in all of history. And the uh, PC type personnel, the people out there were trying to obliterate it. Uh, just treat it as something which uh, never happened. Do, do you think there's a message from World War II for future generations that, that you would see? Oh, uh, yes. That I think we have to be able to look at the world realistically. This idea of deciding what your ideal is, our ideal is peace. That's a guarantee of war. Uh, it's, a, it's strange because you can get a Ted Bundy type uh, out here and everybody agrees that he went out there and he killed dozens of young women. And I'm sure that there were those among them that pleaded with him, please, please do whatever you want, just don't kill me. Uh, but he did anyhow because he felt like it. Now we're willing to concede 
that the Ted Bundys exist in this world. But there are also another type of Ted Bundy. These are the guys that go into politics because they love war. And you can say, you know, please, 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 uh, don't, don't make war. And they're going to smile at you and say, yeah. So the best way to convert a militarist to pacifism is to leave him with a very shrewd idea that if he goes to war, he's the one that'll regret it most. Uh, otherwise, we're going to have it. And we're going to have it and have it and have it. And this next century is going to be far worse than, uh, than the last century. Uh, this is personal, philo personal knowledge of history and so forth. But I think that when you, if you project yourself ahead in time, maybe 500 years or so, and look back and read the history of this period, they'll be referring to it as the period of the 300-year war. The first shot was fired with the American Declaration of Independence. And that set something fresh and new into the world. Before that, the church owned your soul and the state owned your body. And the Declaration of Independence made it for the first time on a national level that the individual owned his soul and his body and that we were entitled to certain fundamental rights. Well, you know, the Revolutionary War ended with our victory. The French that had helped us went back and took their revolution with them. And of course that went to the, all the excesses and we got Napoleon. But uh, Napoleon spread the virus around Europe and Russia and right after the Napoleonic Wars, Russia freed the serfs before we ever got around to freeing the slaves. Uh, then Germany picked up on it. Then Italy under Garibaldi. Then Spain. Uh, by the 1840s, the virus had gotten spread completely around the world. And you can go to China and Sun Yat-sen, uh, the king of Siam sending Abraham Lincoln a, a group of war elephants to help him free the slaves, and also outlawing slavery in, Thai, in Siam or Thailand. Uh, by the time of, uh, well, during this entire period, all of Spain's colonies uh, rebelled. And one after the other, they declared independence and a republic. Most of them modeled right after this country. Uh, then came World War I. When World War I started, the whole world, virtually every country, with but a few exceptions, was ruled by a monarchy. At the end of the war, you could count monarchies on fingers of two hands. And those were mostly the monarchies that had adapted so that they were mainly heads of state with a parliamentary system, elective, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, the problem is that the Declaration of Independence never set limits. And every little splinter group feels it's its sovereign right to declare independence and do unto others. And we're seeing this fractioning and splintering all over the world. Hutus against Tutsis and so on and so forth. You murder each other off, Jews against Arabs, Bosnia, Croatia, uh, Serbia. Uh, all of these are groups that say, well, it's our sovereign right to be independent and to kill our, those that are, don't go along with us. So I think that this next century is going to be the one where 
eventually it's going to be very messy neighborhood wars and when it's all done I think that we'll have learned got, uh, arrived at some sort of a consensus of the limitations of freedom that it implies responsibility we've lost track of that in this country uh, so it's going to hit us just about as hard It'll take a while, but I think we're in for that for the next century. Uh, I'm sure that any number of people would scoff and say, well, this guy's completely stupid or uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about or whatever, but I think it'll happen. The logic is there. I, mean, I gotta switch tape here just to say it's beeping me. The fact that you say that uh uh, you're trying to make sense out of World War II. Did I hear that right? I mean, are you saying that to you, being in World War II, there was something that didn't? Well, World War II, you have to remember that I was a combat soldier. And combat is exceedingly myopic. When you're being shot at, you see just like this. You're, you're concentrating on the guys that are trying to kill you. Uh, the reality is that much of the time I had no idea what was going on on either side of me. And this let everything stay in a kind of a kaleidoscopic uh, perspective. You know, look over there and look over there for a moment. And you don't, you know, it doesn't make any particular sense. My unit that I was in made a lot of sense, sort of. <laughs> but uh, what happened in the outfit next to me on either side, <coughs> excuse me, uh, really was unknown. You'd hear stories later on, but uh, we had a term for those back then. They called them latrinograms. Uh, What's the latest latrinogram? Some of them were true, some of them weren't true, but uh, that's what this, that was the phrase. So wartime rumors. Yeah. Uh, heard one I'm not sure of, and I should probably not even mention it, but there was this anecdote with one of the divisions down the line uh, where the German, retreating Germans in France had uh, booby-trapped a whorehouse, house of prostitution. It was the highest class house in that area because they knew that that would be put off limits to everybody except senior officers. And it blew up and wiped out, uh, 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 killed a number of uh, senior officers, including at least one brigadier general. And of course, they all got Purple Hearts posthumously. But, uh, uh, you know, whether that actually happened or not, I've never seen it in a book, and I'm sure that any books would not mention that either. So whether, did it happen or didn't it happen? I don't know. Uh, I'm sure they would have changed the details a little bit to protect the yes. married. Uh, <clears throat> huh. Exactly. Now, so where, where did you end up? Where did, where were you, where did you get stationed for, for active uh, combat duty? Well, I was Normandy to the Bulge, and then I got to Nibelid and back at the Bulge. Uh, I think it was artillery, but I don't know, because I got a big gap in my memory there. Uh, shattered right arm, virtually all these ribs broken, uh, metal plate in my head. Uh, uh, I don't even remember what day it happened. Uh, I just know that the bulge, everything else that happened in the war, I could find something positive to say about it. D-Day, you had that feeling that you were part of something enormous, vast, enormous. You know, 10,000 planes overhead and all of them yours. 
4,000 ships out in the water, uh, all of them yours. Uh, you know, you knew that you were part of something stupendous. Didn't make you feel, you were still terrified, but you were, you felt as if you were, you know, a, a human wave or whatever. But there wasn't one single solitary nice thing about the bulge. Nothing. Uh, I don't know about the others because we didn't even, even in the moments, the few moments that we had to, to ourselves, uh, you know, or, uh, nobody even talked about dying because I think we all figured we were going to die. But we just wanted to make it as expensive as we could for the Germans. You know, one small little unit who started, supposed to have been about 380 TOE strength, and we were at about 315 or thereabouts. And here are 10,000 Germans coming at us. And that ain't nice. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until later, much later, uh, that I learned through one of the, through several of the books that uh, the Germans didn't have enough fuel that they, for their tanks, that uh, the tanks just had enough fuel to get them to our POL depots along the Meuse River. And uh, they were supposed to refuel fuel from our supplies. And so to us, those tanks were coming. We, you know, we assumed they had fuel in them. Uh, and, but uh, they were coming along a narrow road where uh, dirt road, by the way, and uh, they had the infantry with them, and you knock some trees down across the road, and the German tanks were pretty much underpowered. Uh, had very good engines in them, but they just could not push the trees aside. So they'd have to move the infantry and the pioneers or the engineers. Uh, out in front to get rid of the trees, so you shoot a few of them, and then they have to deploy their forces. And when they start to deploy, you've got troops out, you know, your men are strewn along the woods. And so when they start to deploy, we all back up another couple of hundred yards and knock a few more trees down. So just kept on until they ran out of fuel. And uh, But uh, we learned a lot of things then that weren't in the books. In the books, they said when you get under mortar attack, you hit the ground. Sometimes that's a good rule, but not when you're in the woods. Because the mortars, uh, when they hit the tree branches, they blow. And the shrapnel from the mortars goes down like that. If you're flat on the ground, you give them the maximum surface area to hit. What you do is you play like you're a green piece or you hug a tree. Uh, <laughs> as close to that tree as you can. You got a tin pot on your head, and with luck, any of the shrapnel will come down on the tin pot. But if not, you've got, it's got a straight line, so mostly it'll just graze you. Uh, incidentally, in this little... Wait, 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 before you, how did you, you said you weren't that, I mean, did, did, Charlie next to you say, you know, hey, uh, stand straight up, or how did they pass that information? Because the books were telling you one thing, or the theory before you got over there, how did they get this new information to you? They didn't. You just learned it on your own. You watch a couple of guys out there get uh, shrapnel, and you just decide that, hey, stand up and get close to a tree. <laughs> Hug a tree. Uh, the men that you, you had out there were not stupid. They really, after this length of time, they knew what they were doing. We were professionals at it by now. But I might point out on this, I couldn't help noticing here on these photographs, these people were not in combat. Uh, those soldiers there. Oh. You know how I can tell? Uh -uh. They had their helmets strapped to their chin. 
if a round comes in and has concussion, if a round hits in front of you, you might not be hit by shrapnel, but that concussion is going to come up and hit your helmet just like that. And if you've got your strap on, it just broke your neck. So <laughs> you see somebody with a dress like that and you say, whoops, he's not being shot at. <laughs> Picture time. Picture time, right. So again, that was knowledge that you gained just being out there or was yeah. it? Yeah. Huh. Uh, we used to, not in our outfit because we were pretty well trained otherwise, but you'd get these infantry outfits and you'd get some new uh, captain or major from, usually lieutenants had worked their way up. They, they were smarter than they seemed. But you get some captain or major who had just been transferred to the, from the States over there. And he'd come out all dressed up and, you know, looking pretty, and he'd expect people to salute him. We did. And the next thing you know, a sniper had gunned him down. <laughs> uh, the ones that had been around a while said, look, fella, if you salute me, I'm going to shoot first. <laughs> you know, it's uh, just part of the rules of the thing. How old were you when you when you uh, landed in Normandy? Seventeen. And, and, and were you I wasn't there? supposed to be. I wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, but they had lots of seventeen-year-olds that were there. The you know the high command orders reality interferes with the orders. Uh, the rule was that a person could enlist at age 17, but he was not supposed to be sent overseas and into combat until he reached 18. Well, by the end of the war, we were sucking dry. Uh, our national population in the 1940 uh, census was just right at 130 million. Uh, by the end of 1945, we had over 12 million in service. Uh, <clears throat> counting the wounded, over a million wounded and dead, that's 10% of the entire population. You figure that half of the population is women. Uh, now, yes, there were very substantial uh, help from the wax and waves, uh, uh, spars, women, marines, and so forth. Uh, but uh, the fact still remains that by the time you got through, you eliminate the children, the elderly, the infirm, uh, people who simply couldn't pass any medical, uh, crippled uh, for one reason or another, essential war work, such as farmers and their families necessary to run the farms. Uh, we were sucking, we were going dry. Uh, in the last batches, they were taking men, uh, one that I know of. Of course, they didn't put them in combat, but they could put them in the quartermaster. He only had one eye. Uh, they had other men who were who had had polio and could just limp along, you stick them in a clerk's job or something, but they're in uniform. Uh, do, do you remember um, landing? I mean, is that a memory of yours or is that Oh yeah, landing D-Day was, uh, as I say, that was a lot of interest there, but the bulge was the one that people ought to remember. Uh, we had, we were cold, we were freezing, uh, our canteens were, had frozen so that all we could do was scoop up snow and uh, try to find a clean spot where you could scoop it up. Uh, our K rations, K rations, a person who's, <laughs> even today I still cringe with the idea of K rations. K 
came in a little box about the size of a Cracker Jack box, camouflage colored. Uh, in it, they had a little can of Spam and eggs or ham and eggs or something like that, just a little dinky thing. Uh, two hardtack cookies that probably were left over from the Civil War. A uh, little fruit bar or d ration chocolate bar, a packet of uh, coffee, instant coffee uh, powder, a uh, little packet like this with four cigarettes in it, names like Domino's and Wings and Picayunes. Every once in a while you'd get a camel or a lucky strike and you'd think, oh boy, I'm lucky. They had a little packet, half packet of uh, uh, matches, tin matches in it. Uh, they had some sugar and powdered cream for the coffee in case you felt like it. Had a little roll of camouflage toilet paper. And I don't know whether I should mention this here or not, but uh, uh, the dye kind of came off. Uh, now, people don't realize it, but toilet paper is the most visible thing imaginable on a battlefield. One single sheet of toilet paper, you can spot it for a quarter of a mile. So this little camouflage toilet paper was the solution to that. And every we'd get new replacements in, and you know the first thing that they would ask is, you know, they're trying to uh, talk to us. Uh, we didn't much want to talk to them because we figured that being freshmen, they'd be dead within the next day or two. But they had asked, how do you survive up here? And our answer would be, just try to stick around long enough to get a green ass. And they had no idea what we meant. But about every week or so, they would get up a shower tent, shower fly. This was four walls of canvas. And then they had the shower heads up there. And we would all strip down and uh, go in there and take, uh, they timed us three minutes for a shower, you know, a minute to soap and two minutes to uh, uh, flush the water and soap off of you. And then after that, you marched out. But you could look at a person's backside and tell how long he had been in the front. Uh, that uh, may not sound very attractive, but it's the way it worked. And that, that's interesting, because I'm glad you brought that up. Nobody told me that before. The, the, the other one, because I've had a couple of uh, bathroom-related ones. The, the other one was a Iwo Jima guy I interviewed, and he said, you know, I made another buddy of mine from Iwo Jima. And I, and I was talking to him, and I said, do you ever remember going to the bathroom at Iwo Jima? He says, I remember peeing on my boots, but I never remember taking a crap. He says, I think we were probably the most constipated Marines out there because we were too afraid to get out and do it, to get out of your foxhole. In that same vein, I don't know what the routine was. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, now, I do know that K rations were deliberately meant to be constipating. Because we still, but we still had about 20, 25% of the men with diarrhea. And I never got it. I was went the other way. I was constipated. Uh, but the guys with diarrhea, they were pitiful. Because uh, how do you stand and shoot and fire and continue like that when you're constantly dribbling? And believe me, it. Uh, uh, the worst of it there was that we only, we didn't have winter uniforms during the bulge, and the temperature got well below zero. And uh, it was just, uh, just miserable. There wasn't any, you know, there was nothing nice about it. Uh, constantly under fire, the Germans kept trying to infiltrate to try and break us. And, uh, when they did, we'd back up a few more yards. And, uh, eventually, they ran out of fuel. 
Uh, they were supposed to reach the, this is not something I knew at the time. This is something I found later, that they were supposed to reach the Moose River uh, on the end of day one. And uh, by the eight, day nine, they were still only about halfway there. And the vehicles were completely out of fuel and no fuel was coming up, so they had to set fire to them and march out. So anytime you look at a map of the German advances in the bulge, you will notice that on the north, there's a little section which goes like this, and then it stops, and then the bulge goes on down. There's a bulge, a little notch in that bulge, and I guess that's where we were. Uh, but they just, uh, you know, there's nothing. Anytime you hear of something like the Spartans at Thermopylae or so forth, there's always a reason for it. If we'd been in open country, they would have taken us out uh, in short order. You know, maybe 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Uh, they would have just rolled over us. But under those particular circumstances, we had a chance and we took it. And it worked. Well, what was it? Um, so what's a day? Because, well, two-part question. How long was the battle for you? And, and what was it like? What was it, where did you sleep? Where did you, what did you do? I mean, how did you? Sleeping, uh, I don't know about others, but I learned to sleep standing up uh, next to a tree. I would start to sleep and I would sleep for maybe 30 or 40 seconds and I'd start to fall, I'd wake up and start shooting again. I was carrying a grease gun. That's a 45 caliber uh, submachine gun that looks just like a grease gun. It's just a metal tube, uh, fires 45 caliber ACP, full automatic, 15 or 30 round clip. Uh, and uh, it uh, had a nice slow cyclic rate of fire, which I dearly loved, because it meant that you could keep shooting longer. <laughs> Uh, the German Schmeiser, the one they called a burp gun, it went burp and it's empty. And the grease gun, if you were really good at it, and I wasn't that good, but uh, if you had nine targets out there, you could fire it full automatic and put one round in each target because it went boom, 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 boom. And you could, if you were fast enough, and it had no recoil because of the way the recoil springs were set up. You could, we had all done it. You could take uh, and cut off the last two coils of the spring and put in shims and until you got it just balanced properly and you could fire that thing from your chin and not feel it. But as far as eating was concerned, uh, sleeping, what we would do on the K rations, they were all frozen anyhow. And we didn't have time to make fires, just didn't have the, uh, you know, we had the little uh, mess tanks, but, uh, you know, little uh, things like that, but we didn't have time for it. And what we would do is uh, hold the can in our chest to try and thaw it out. Uh, but most of the time what we'd do is take the powdered coffee, pour it down like that in our mouths and then grab a handful of snow to get it down to get the caffeine in us. And then we'd smoke one cigarette after another. And those were the ways that we kept awake because it was going 24 hours a day for, my last memory was seven, eight days, I don't know. Uh, it was just a complete nightmare. Uh, I got married, uh, in fact, on the 10th of November of this year, it'll be 43 years ago, which was seven years after uh, the bulge. 
And my wife can testify, I was still waking up with nightmares. I'd sometimes wake up fighting and so on. Uh, get something. And the worst of it is, is I was uh, able to realize and say, I know this is a nightmare, I know I'm asleep. Change the subject, damn it. And it wouldn't change. And all of a sudden I'd wake up and I'd be yelling or uh, not so much yelling, but uh, I would spring out of the bed and so forth. Uh, it just, uh, uh, okay, I mean, it happened. <laughs> and I'm not trying to make it sound mock heroic, or I'm, not, I'm sure not trying to do, I got some syndrome left over. It's just that any time somebody shoots at you, seriously, something changes. Now, in all these years, I have never felt completely comfortable back in society. Relieved, yes. I uh, raised a couple of some really neat kids. Uh, they've uh, done very well for themselves, and we're still very close. Uh, even though we're spread out all over the place, it's, we're still a family. Now, my grandfather did the same thing, you know, and he was a Civil War vet. But the, somewhere there's a little sense of estrangement. Uh, right after the war, right after I was discharged, after the end of the war, uh, I took a, started to take a job selling uh, stocks and bonds before, before I went back to college. I figured, well, it would be a way of earning some money and so forth. And they had some fellow there who was a major, Pentagon chair board type. And he started this spiel about what we were going to be doing now would be the most important thing we would ever do in our lives. That would be, we would be assuring the financial security of a whole generation, and et cetera. And I thought to myself, this is important. What was I doing back there? I got up and walked out. And uh, I don't think he ever understood. I mean, he was, he was purely chairborn. And they had no conception. Uh, if you're not shot at, you know, you can be quartermaster uh, uh, 20 or 30 miles behind the line. If you're not shot at, you can do any number of things. Uh, and we used to laugh at the antics of some of these uh, uh, types. Uh, in truth, we wound up hating our quartermaster far more than we hated the Germans. Uh, you know, they had all the pretty uniforms. They got the winter uniforms while we were in the snow, feasting our toots off. And Anytime you'd see them, they always had a chest full of ribbons that they were wearing. Uh, and they would go around and they'd hear a roar and they would duck, you know, if they were with a girl. They would duck. Oh my goodness. You know, it's just that stress from combat, you know, take pity on us. Invite us into your bedroom. And they would talk about, oh, those burp guns, those are terrible, terrible, terrible things. The reality is, if you heard them, you were safe because they were empty. And you had about uh, two to three seconds to try and locate where it came from and shoot them. A lot of the time you could, or some of the time you couldn't, then you were in trouble. <laughs> uh, but uh, the one of the 
weapons the Germans had that I wish we had had it at the time, but they had a little 37 millimeter. They called it a PAK, P-A-K, I don't know what it stood for. But it fired a high velocity armor piercing round which would go right through our tanks. The M4 tank had no business being on the battlefield of the German tanks. But they also had an HE round that was real nasty. Uh, didn't see many of them, but when you did see one, it was something you wanted to watch out for. The 88 that you hear so much about was mainly a long-range weapon. Uh, if you got close to them, yes, they, could, they would be close-range weapons, but mostly they were designed to hit in back of you. But the mortars, now, those were nasty because you could be in a hole and it, would, it could still come in and say hello. Uh, but uh, the Germans were also, about this stage of the war, the ones we were in this group, anyhow, most of them had automatic uh, assault weapons. But I don't know, this may sound strange, uh, in view of all the propaganda about assault weapons. In World War II, the term assault weapon had a very specific significance. It was underpowered. All of them were. The idea was to get something that would hold as many rounds as possible, which means they had to be little dinky rounds. And uh, the AK-47, for instance, was an underpowered 9 millimeter, underpowered 38. And those things, they could hit you five or six times, and it might take you 10 minutes to realize you're dead. In the meantime, you could kill half a dozen of them. So when they talk about assault weapons in the popular parlance today, they're blowing smoke. They're just talking about high capacity, full automatic weapons. <coughs> and uh, that's not a, uh, those are hardly ever in use. Did, at one point you talked about um, coming back and I can't remember the exact word you used, but not being a part of, I think estranged or something. You used. Did, did, did the idea of war, um, uh, did it create a moral dilemma with you? Uh, no. Uh, some people it did. But in my case, in my outfit's case, I, I don't think it made... Uh, it isn't... Now, I will say this. You know, I was a ranger. And ranger training, I did not know this at the time but it's obvious that I passed. Uh, one of the surest ways of getting kicked out of the Rangers was if any of your instructors got the idea that you enjoyed killing. You were out. Even today, from, I, I know several who are in the Rangers, uh, uh, including one of the captains there, out here at Fort Lewis, he said that's still the rule, that you'll see a lots of guys out uh, carrying the Ranger patch, but they're not in a Ranger unit. They've taken the course, but they weren't assigned a Ranger unit. And I approve wholeheartedly, because visualize yourself, the, the, the purpose of the Rangers is not to kill. The purpose of the Rangers is to throw your opponent off balance to surprise him, to catch him where he doesn't expect it, to disorganize his rear, to interfere with his uh, maneuvering, to confuse him. Now you're out with a three-man patrol and you're five miles behind the German lines who just infiltrated. And I've done that. Now, you got some guy with a... When, when I led, I was... Uh, used to be the head of a three, one of the three-man teams. And I wouldn't let anybody carry a, a firearm. 
visualize it. I, I could listen at the time. In fact, I could still do it today and distinguish between a German weapon and an American weapon by the sound. Now, I'm five miles on the other side of the German lines. And I got some kill crazy idiot sitting next to me that sees, oh, crap, bang. I've just alerted the ent entire German army that we're here. And they're not going to stop until they got us. So your only hope is to be invisible. Don't let them even suspect that there's anybody there. They're perfectly safe. You don't kill them. You don't sneak up on a sentry and slit his throat either. Unless you're on a combat mission. If you're on a combat mission, then you've got a, a significant force with you. But if you're out there on a recon, uh, 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 because somebody's going to stumble over that man. When they stumble over him, they're going to take one look and that's it. You're dead. Uh, so, no, you don't, uh, anybody who enjoys killing has no business in the Rangers. Who, when, when you were at war, in your mind then, who or what were you fighting? And do you fight from anger or? No. The man who's angry dies. You've got to be very cool on it. You have to fight fear and you have to fight anger. Uh, there was a kind of a gritty feeling that the war had to be won, that what we were fighting was something that, uh, maybe this would sound strange, but uh, in view of the way that people reacted, but I was never angry at all with the Japanese. Uh, I was with the Germans. Uh, the reason on the Japanese is part of me said, well, you know, I guess that's fair. I guess anybody's entitled to make one stab at conquering the world. But the Krauts, they're trying to make a career of it. I mean, that was, that, that sounds kind of strange, but it, I remember even then, when I heard about them interning the Japanese, my attitude, this was while I was still a civilian, my attitude was, well, if they're going to do that, they'd better intern all the Germans, too. Uh, you, you, these are, you know, these are Americans, and until they show that they're disloyal, then uh, leave them alone. So, uh, this, this was the attitude that I had on the thing, but there was a realization. You know, first came uh, Austria, then the Sudetenland, then Czechoslovakia, then Poland, then Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, Holland, Luxembourg, uh, Denmark, Norway, and it was obvious that Hitler was just, uh, the Germans were just cat taking anything and everything without any, uh, they were just out to conquer. Uh, it wasn't a case of uh, defending themselves, they were just, anything that stood in their way, they were going to, going to destroy it. Uh, and after Poland, there was no way that I could, in my own mind, justify what they were doing. And something was evil in the world and it needed to be stopped. And I was part of the stopping force. Did you see that evil as? Not theological, just evil. <laughs> but I mean, did you see it as people, a country? A country. A country. And even then, uh, Maybe it was me, but I've always had a little bit of a sense of balance. Uh, because I remember in the United States, right out here, for instance, they had the silver shirts. The Swedish Nazi Party. It had Fort Hermann Goering out here at Eatonville. 
and they threatened if the United States uh, marched against Germany, they would t uh, come down and capture uh, uh, Fort Lewis and prevent it from helping the Germans. Uh, no kidding. Read your newspapers from back. You know, go back and look through your newspapers, and you'll find occasional mention of Fort Herman Goering. But uh, my added, my feeling was that. Hey, they're good Germans. Uh, you know, uh, look at Goethe uh, in his uh, five volumes of Faust and Schopenhauer and Hegel and uh, Beethoven, Mozart. Uh, they're not all bad, but the ones that are doing that sure have to be stopped. And whatever it takes to stop them is what I'm going to have to do, or what we're going to have to do. So there was no compunction in the killing, but it was never enjoyable. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but... No, it does. It does. You know, it's interesting, you're the first one that has said uh, you're disliked for the German and not for the Japanese. Most of the people I've talked to have said Japanese, Japanese, even though we're fighting Germans. But, uh, but seeing your full perspective to it is, is interesting also. Um, I had a thought, and it just like, uh, oh, when you see the American flag go by, or you hear the national anthem, Star Spangled Banner, what do you feel? The flag, I always come to attention and put my hand over my heart. The Star Spangled Banner, uh, doesn't much influence me. It's been so prostituted. You know, every football game, every baseball game, uh, uh, what was that uh, fat uh, movie actress, uh, comedian? That, oh, Roseanne Barr. Roseanne Barr. Oh, yeah. Uh, screeching at... Uh, and uh, grabbing her crotch. Uh, uh -uh. As far as making it a law, outlawing burning the flag, uh, no, I don't favor such a law. We have too many laws as it stands. Uh, if a person does not have patriotism, no law is going to force it on him. And what, we, what I'm seeing is a sort of a reaction that, yeah, you are going to be, as American citizens, you will have absolute freedom to do precisely what we order. And that, uh, that bothers me no end. It raises my hackles and encourages the rebel in me. Uh, just the other day, uh, uh, I was dealing with a problem uh, on okay, tax rules and so forth, that there were a, a number of uh, Cambodians out who had rented, uh, would lease sections of the forest to collect uh, salal and bear grass. And uh, the state was, I was talking on behalf of one of them, and the, this one woman on the other side was saying, well, that's been unregulated entirely too long. Does everything have to be regulated by the state? And if everything has to be regulated, what freedom have any of us got? Why can't we do things occasionally that aren't regulated? And this, as I say, it raises hackles. Uh, I think I ought to have, as a presumably free individual, certain rights and prerogatives. And about the only one that they are prepared to concede anymore is my right to sleep with whomever I choose. 
And uh, since I'm well and happily married, that right doesn't much mean doesn't mean much to me. So uh, I don't know whether I've answered your question or not. No, he but did. He did very much so. Yeah, the full the full gamut of it. And I liked what he said. They cannot regulate patriotism. You can't make somebody be a patriot. Agreed. And. It's the right of people to do things that irritate me. But it's my right to be able to do things that irritate them without having them run to the nearest shyster or run to the police or whatever. And you know, it's not a one-way affair, but uh, the uh, old, I grew up in a period when uh, people's attitude was far more relaxed. That Hey, you know, yeah, I give a little. It's their their right to do it. Might irritate me, but I'm not going to go screaming off. And, but they got to give me the right to do some of the things that they don't like. And now everybody's out there to try and compel everyone else to uh, follow their whims. And the country has suffered much for that. Uh, But it's the question of, you know, how do you put the genie back in the bottle? The sense of tolerance uh, of personal idiosyncrasies has just gone by the wayside. Uh, you know, if neighbors don't like the color you paint your house, they go to court and sue you for it. Well, I'm sorry. that. Uh, the fact that the courts involve themselves with that uh, s says a great deal for the uh, corruption of the courts. Because, you know, I don't care what you try to do. If you're willing to pay the money, you'll get some shyster that'll file a lawsuit on you, your behalf. Yeah. That's and not what you were fighting for. In the that is not what I was fighting for. Uh, a few years back when they had the 50th anniversary of the D-Day landings, there was a fellow there, he had been a flyboy. Uh, we were out here, I'd been invited out. To, I was one of the few ground pounders that had survived apparently. Uh, but he had been a flyboy. And we were chatting and just out of nowhere he said, tell me, are you happy with the way things turned out? I thought even, hell no, <laughs> me either. <laughs> he separated on that note. Uh, it's just that the difference between a somewhat relaxed, tolerant, easygoing society. Now that tolerance back then was restricted because of the uh, intolerance towards blacks and the uh, th some very some other things, but uh, towards Orientals, etc. And that intolerance is largely, not entirely, but largely evaporated. So that might be a little bit of improvement there, but in return for getting little tolerance there, we've lost all of the peripheral tolerance. And everything has to be structured. Uh, you notice uh, when my son was growing up, they'd go out and uh, we had a fairly good sized yard and location there, and they'd go out and play uh, baseball, sort of, with their own rules. And uh, <coughs> I had one of the neighbors come over and say, well, why aren't you teaching them how to play baseball right? I said, because they're having fun this way. The other way, it, uh, I'm just going to be trying to make them be grown up about it. And <coughs> kids deserve the right to make up their own games. Provi and, uh, I think if we allowed 
more of the making up their own games to kids and gave them the space to make up their games, we wouldn't have half the trouble we do today.